Volume One, Chapter Eight of Clayhanger by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume One, Chapter Eight, In the Shop. Here, lad," said his father to Edwin as soon as he had scraped up the last crumbs of cheese from his plate at the end of dinner on the following day. Edwin rose obediently and followed him out of the room. Having waited at the top of the stairs until his father had reached the foot, he leaned forward as far as he could with one hand on the rail and the other pressing against the wall, swooped down to the mat at the bottom without touching a single step on the way, and made a rocket-like noise with his mouth. He had no other manner of descending the staircase unless he happened to be in disgrace. His father went straight to the desk in the corner behind the account-book window, assumed his spectacles, and lifted the lid of the desk. "'Here,' yeah, he said in a low voice, "'Mr. Enoch Peake is stepping in this afternoon to look at this here.' He displayed the proof, an unusually elaborate wedding card, which announced the marriage of Mr. Enoch Peake with Mrs. Louisa Loggerheads. "'You know him as I mean?' "'Yes,' said Edwin, "'the stout man, the Cockney's Gardens man.' "'That's him.' "'Well, you tell him I've been called away. "'Tell him who we are, not but what he'll know. "'Tell him I think it might be better,' "'Derice's thick finger ran along a line of print, "'if we put Widow of the late Simon Loggerheads Esquire "'instead of Esquire. "'See? "'Otherwise it's all right. "'Tell him I says otherwise it's all right. "'And ask him if he'll have it printed in silver "'and how many he wants, and show him this sample envelope. "'Now, do you understand?' "'Yes,' said Edwin in a tone to convey, not disrespectfully, that there was nothing to understand. Curious how his father had the air of bracing all his intellect, as if to a problem. "'Then you take it to Big James, and he can start Chawner on it. Job's promised for Monday forenoon.' "'Will Big James be working?' asked Edwin, for it was Saturday afternoon, when, though the shop remained open, the printing office was closed. "'They're all on overtime,' said Mr. Clayhanger. And then he added, in a voice still lower, and with a surreptitious glance at Miss Ingermells, the shopwoman, who was stolidly unfolding newspapers in wrappers at the opposite counter. "'See to it yourself, now. He won't want to talk to her about a thing like that. Tell him I told you specially. Just let me see how well you can do it.' "'Right,' said Edwin, and to himself, superciliously, "'it might be life and death.' "'We ought to be doing a lot of business with Enoch Peake later on,' Mr. Clayhanger finished in a whisper. "'I see,' said Edwin, impressed, perceiving that he had perhaps been supercilious too long. Mr. Clayhanger returned his spectacles to their case, and, taking his hat from its customary hook behind him, over the job files, consulted his watch and passed round the counter to go. Then he stopped. "'I'm going to Manchester,' he murmured confidentially. "'See if I can pick up a machine, as I've heard of.' Edwin was flattered. At the dinner-table Mr. Clayhanger had only vouchsafed that he had a train to catch, and would probably not be in till late at night. The next moment he glimpsed Darius through the window, his arms motionless by his sides and sticking slightly out, hurrying in the sunshine along Wedgwood Street in the direction of Shawport Station. 2. So this was business. It was not the business he desired and meant to have, and he was uneasy at the extent to which he was already entangled in it, but it was rather amusing, and his father had really been very friendly. He felt a sense of importance. Soon afterwards Clara ran into the shop to speak to Miss Ingermells. The two chatted and giggled together. "'Father's gone to Manchester,' he found opportunity to say to Clara as she was leaving. "'Why aren't you doing those prizes he told you to do?' retorted Clara, and vanished. She wanted none of Edwin's superior airs. During dinner Mr. Clayhanger had instructed his son to go through the Sunday school prize stock and make an inventory of it. This injunction from the child Clara, which Miss Ingermells had certainly overheard, prevented him, as an independent man, from beginning his work for at least ten minutes. He whistled, opened his father's desk and stared vacantly into it, examined the pen-nib case in detail, and tore off two leaves from the date Canada so that it should be ready for Monday. He had a great scorn for Miss Ingermells, who was a personable, if somewhat heavy, creature of twenty-eight, because she kept company with a young man. He caught them arm in arm, and practically hugging each other one Sunday afternoon in the street. He could see naught but silliness in that kind of thing. 
the entrance of a customer caused him to turn abruptly to the high shelves where the books were kept. He was glad that the customer was not Mr. Enoch Peake, the expectation of whose arrival made him curiously nervous. He placed the stepladder against the shelves, climbed up, and began to finger volumes and parcels of volumes. The dust was incredible. The disorder filled him with contempt. It was astounding that his father could tolerate such disorder. No doubt the whole shop was in the same condition. Thirteen Archie's old desk, he read on a parcel. But when he opened the parcel he found seven from jest to earnest. Hence he had to undo every parcel. However, the work was easy. He first wrote the inventory in pencil, then he copied it in ink. Then he folded it, and wrote very carefully on the back, because his father had a mania for endorsing documents in the legal manner. Inventory of Sunday School Prize Stock. And after an instant's hesitation, he added his own initials. Then he began to tie up and restore the parcels and the single volumes. None of all this literature had any charm for him. He possessed five or six such books, all gilt and chromatic, which had been awarded to him at Sunday school, suitably inscribed for doing nothing in particular, and he regarded them without exception as frauds upon boyhood. However, Clara had always enjoyed reading them. But lying flat on one of the top shelves, he discovered, nearly at the end of his task, an oblong tome which did interest him. Casanova's Architectural Views of European Capitals with Descriptive Letterpress. It had an old-fashioned look, and was probably some relic of his father's predecessor in the establishment. Another example of the lack of order which prevailed. 3. He took the volume to the retreat of the desk, and there turned over its pages of coloured illustrations. At first his interest in them, and in the letterpress, was less instinctive than deliberate. He said to himself, "'Now, if there is anything in me, I ought really to be interested in this, and I must be interested in it.' And he was. He glanced carelessly at the clock, which was hung above the shelves of exercise-books and notebooks, exactly opposite the door. A quarter past four. The afternoon was quietly passing, and he had not found it too tedious. In the background of the task, which, he considered, he had accomplished with extraordinary efficiency, his senses noted faintly the continual trickle of customers, all of whom were infallibly drawn to Miss Ingemell's counter by her mere watchful and receptive appearance. He had heard phrases and ends of phrases such as, "'No, we haven't anything smaller,' "'A, a camel hair brush, "'Gum but not glue,' "'Very sorry, sir, I'll speak firmly to the paper boy.' And the sounds of coins dragged along the counter, the sound of the testing of half a sovereign, the opening and shutting of the till drawer, and occasionally Miss Ingemell's exclaiming to herself about the stupidity of customers after a customer had gone, and once Miss Ingemell's crossing angry to fix the door ajar which some heedless customer had closed. Did they suppose that people didn't want air like other people? And now it was a quarter past four. Undoubtedly he had a peculiar and pleasant feeling of importance. In another half minute he glanced at the clock again, and it was a quarter to five. What hypnotism attracted him towards the artist's materials cabinet which stood magnificent, complicated, and complete in the middle of the shop, like a monument? His father, after one infantile, disastrous raid, had absolutely forbidden any visitation of that cabinet, with its last case of assorted paints, crayons, brushes, and pencils, and its innumerable long drawers full of paper and card, and wondrous perfectly equipped boxes and T-squares and set-squares, with a hundred other contrivances. But, of course, the order had now ceased to have force. Edwin had left school, and, if he was not a man, he was certainly not a boy. He began to open the drawers, at first gingerly, then boldly. After all, it was no business of Miss Ingemell's, and, to be just, Miss Ingemell's made no sort of pretence that it was any business of hers. She proceeded with her own business. Edwin opened a rather large wooden watercolour box. It was marked five and sixpence. It seemed to comprise everything needed for the production of the most entrancing and majestic architectural views, and as Edwin took out its upper case and discovered still further marvellous devices and apparatus in its basement beneath, he dimly but passionately saw, in his heart, bright masterpieces that ought to be the fruit of that box. There was a key to it. He must have it. 
he would have given all that he possessed for it, if necessary. 4. Miss Ingemelth, he said, and as she did not look up immediately, I say, Miss Ingemelth, how much does father take off from the shilling to auntie when she buys anything? Don't ask me, Master Edwin, said Miss Ingemelth. I don't know. How should I know? Well, then, he muttered, I shall pay full price for it, that's all. He could not wait, and he wanted to be on the safe side. Miss Ingemelz gave him change for his half-sovereign in a strictly impartial manner, to indicate that she accepted no responsibility. And the squaring of Edwin's shoulders conveyed to Miss Ingemelz that he advised her to keep carefully within her own sphere, and not to make impertinent inquiries about the origin of the half-sovereign, which he could see intrigued her acutely. He now owned the box. It was not a box of colours, but a box of enchantment. He had had colour-boxes before, but nothing to compare with this, nothing that could have seemed magical to anybody wiser than a very small boy. Then he bought some cartridge paper. He considered that cartridge paper would be good enough for preliminary experiments. 5. It was while he was paying for the cartridge paper, he being, as was indeed proper, on the customer's side of the counter, that a heavy, loutish boy in an apron entered the shop, blushing. Edwin turned away. This was Miss Ingemelz's affair. "'If you please, Mr. Peake sent me. He can have come in this afternoon. He's got a bit of ratting on. Will Mr. Clayhanger step across to the dragon tonight after raid with that there paper as he knows on?' At the name of Peake, Edwin started. He had utterly forgotten the matter. "'Master Edwin,' said Miss Ingemelz dryly, "'you know all about that, don't you?' Clearly she resented that he knew all about that, while she didn't. "'Oh, yes,' Edwin stammered. Uh, "'What did you say?' It was his first piece of real business. "'If you please, Mr. Peake sent me.' The messenger blundered through his message again, word for word. "'Very well, I'll attend to it,' said Edwin, as nonchalantly as he could. Nevertheless, he was at a loss what to do, simple though the situation might have seemed to a person with an experience of business longer than Edwin's. Just as three hours previously his father had appeared to be bracing all his intellect to a problem that struck Edwin as entirely simple, so now Edwin seemed to be bracing all his intellect to another aspect of the same problem. Time, revenging his father. What? Go across to the dragon, and in cold blood demand Mr. Enoch Peake, and then party with Mr. Enoch Peake as one man with another? He'd never been inside the dragon. He had been brought up into the belief that the dragon was a place of sin. The dragon was included in the generic term Gin Palace, and quite probably in the Siamese twin term Gaming Saloon. Moreover, to discuss business with Mr. Enoch Peake. Mr. Enoch Peake was as serious to Edwin as, say, a Chinese Mandarin. Still, business was business, and something would have to be done. He did not know what. Ought he to go to the dragon? His father had not foreseen the possibility of this development. He instantly decided one fundamental. He would not consult Miss Ingebels, no, nor even Maggie. There remained only Big James. He went across to see Big James, who was calmly smoking a pipe on the little landing at the top of the steps leading to the printing office. Big James showed no astonishment. "'You come along o' me to the dragon tonight, young sir, at eight o'clock.' or as soon after as makes no matter, and I'll see as you see, Mr. Ebbin Peake. I shall be coming up Woodison Bank at eight o'clock, or as soon after as makes no matter. You'll be waiting for me at the back gates there, and I'll see as you see, Mr. Enoch Peake. Are you going to the dragon? Am I going to the dragon, young sir? exclaimed Big James in his majestic voice. End of Volume 1, Chapter 8《ボリューム1》、《Chapter 9》of《Clayhanger》by Arnold Bennett。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Recording by Simon Evers。Volume 1》、《Chapter 9》、The Town。James Yarlett was worthy of his nickname. He stood six feet four and a half inches in height, and his girth was proportionate. He had enormous hands and feet, large features, and a magnificent long dark brown beard. Owing to this beard, his necktie was never seen. But the most magnificent thing about him was his bass voice, 
acknowledged to be the finest base in the town, and one of the finest even in Hambridge, where, in his earlier prime, James had lived as a news comp on the Staffordshire Signal. He was now a jobbing comp in Bursley, because Bursley was his native town, and because he preferred jobbing. He made the fourth and heaviest member of the celebrated Bursley male glee party, the other three being Arthur Smallwright, an old man with a striking falsetto voice, Abraham Harrocles, and Jos Rawnpike, pronounced Rampick. These men were accustomed to fame, and Big John was the king of them, though the mildest. They sang at dinners, free and easies, concerts, and Martinmas tea meetings. They sang for the glory, and when there was no demand for their services, they sang to themselves, for the sake of singing. Each of them was a star in some church or chapel choir, and except Arthur Smallrice, they all shared a certain elasticity of religious opinion. Big James, for example, had varied in ten years from Wesleyan, through Old Church, to Roman Catholic, up at Bleakleridge. It all depended on niceties in the treatment accorded to him, and on the choice of anthems. Moreover, he liked a change. He was what his superiors call a very superior man. Owing to the more careful enunciation required in singing, he had lost a great deal of the five towns accent, and one cannot be a compositor for a quarter of a century without insensibly acquiring an education and a store of knowledge far excelling the ordinary. His manner was gentle, and perhaps somewhat pompous, as is common with very big men, but you could never be sure whether an extremely subdued humour did not underlie his pomposity. He was a bachelor, aged forty-five, and lived quietly with a married sister at the bottom of Woodison Bank, near the national schools. The wonder was that, with all his advantages, he had not more deeply impressed himself upon Bursley as an individuality, and not merely as a voice. But he seemed never to seek to do so. He was without ambition, and though curiously careful sometimes about preserving his own dignity, and beyond question sensitive by temperament, he showed marked respect, and even humility, to the worldly successful. Despite his bigness and simplicity, there was something small about him which came out in odd, trifling details. Thus it was characteristic of Big James to ask Edwin to be waiting for him at the back gates in Woodison Bank, when he might just as easily have met him at the side door by the closed shop in Wedgwood Street. Edwin, who from mere pride had said nothing to his sisters about the impending visit to the dragon, was a little surprised and dashed to see Big James in broadcloth and a high hat, for he, he had not dreamed of changing his own everyday suit, nor had it occurred to him that the dragon was a temple of ceremoniousness. Big James looked enormous. The wide lapel of his shining frock coat was buttoned high up under his beard and curved downward for a distance of considerably more than a yard to his knees. It was a heroic frock coat. The sleeves were wide, but narrowing at the wrists, and the white wristbands were very tight. The trousers fell in ample folds on the uppers of the gigantic boots. Big James had a way of sticking out his chest and throwing his head back, which would have projected the tip of his beard ten inches forth from his body, had the beard been stiff. But the soft silkiness of the beard frustrated this spectacular phenomenon, which would have been very interesting to witness. Two. The pair stepped across Trafalgar Road together. Edwin, though he tried to be sedate, nothing but a frisking morsel by the side of the vast monument. Compared with the architectural grandeur of Mr. Varnet, his thin, supple, free-moving limbs had an almost pathetic appearance of ephemeral fragility. Big James directed himself to the archway leading to the dragon's tables, and there he saw an ostler, or odd man. Edwin, feeling the imminence of an ordeal, surreptitiously explored a pocket to be sure that the proof of the wedding card was safely there. The ostler raised his reddish eyebrows to Big James. Big James jerked his head to one side, indicating apparently the entire dragon, and simultaneously conveying a query. The ostler paused immobile an instant, and then shook his insignificant turnip pate. Big James turned away. No word had been spoken. Nevertheless, the men had exchanged a dialogue which might be thus put into words. "'I wasn't thinking to see you so soon,' from the ostler. "'Then nobody of any importance has yet gone into the assembly room?' from Big James. "'Nobody worth speaking of and won't for a while,' from the other. 
then I'll take a turn from Big James. The latter now looked down at Edwin and addressed him in words. Seemingly we're too soon, Mr. Edwin. What do you say to a turn round the town, playground way? I doubt it we should be too soon. Edwin showed alacrity. As a schoolboy, it had been definitely forbidden to him to go out at night, and unless sent on a special and hurried errand, he had scarcely seen the physiognomy of the streets after eight o'clock. He had never seen the playground in the evening. And this evening the town did not seem like the same town. It had become a new and mysterious town of adventure. And yet Edwin was not fifty yards away from his own bedroom. They ascended Duck Bank together, Edwin proud to be with a celebrity of the calibre of Big James, and Big James calmly satisfied to show himself thus formally with his master's son. It appeared almost incredible that those two immortals, so diverse, had issued from the womb practically alike, that a few brief years on the earth had given Big James such a tremendous physical advantage. Several hours' daily submission to the exact regularities of lines of type and to the unvarying demands of minutely adjusted machines in motion, had stamped Big James's body and mind with a delicate and quasi-finicking preciseness which characterises all compositors and printers. And the continual monotonous performance of similar tasks that employed his faculties while never absorbing or straining them had soothed and dulled the fever of life in him to a beneficent calm, a calm refined and beautified by the pleasurable exercise of song. Big James had seldom known a violent emotion. He had craved nothing, sought for nothing, and lost nothing. Edwin, like Big James in progress from everlasting to everlasting, was all inchoate, unformed, undisciplined, and burning with capricious fires, all expectant, eager, reluctant, tingling, timid, innocently and wistfully audacious. By taking the boy's hand, Big James might have poetically symbolised their relation. 3. "'Are you going to sing tonight at the Dragon, Mr. Yarlett?' asked Edwin. He lengthened his step to Big James's, controlled his ardent body, and tried to remember that he was a man with a man. "'I am young, sir,' said Big James. "'There is a party of us.' "'Is it the male glee party?' Edwin pursued. "'Yes, Mr. Edwin.' "'Then Mr. Smallrice will be there.' "'He will, Mr. Edwin.' "'Why can Mr. Smallrice sing such high notes?' Big James slowly shook his head as Edwin looked up at him. "'I'll tell you what it is, young sir. It's a gift, that's what it is. Same as I can sing law.' "'But Mr. Smallrice is very old, isn't he?' "'There's a parrot in a cage over the dock there as is eighty-five years old, and that's proved by record kept, young sir.' "'No.' protested Edwin's incredulity politely. "'By record kept,' said Big James. "'Do you often sing at the Dragon, Mr. Yarlett?' "'Time was,' said Big James, "'when some of us used to sing there every night, Sundays accepted, and concerts and what not accepted. "'Aye, for hours and hours every night. "'Still do sometimes.' "'After your work?' "'After our work, aye, and often till dawn in summer. "'One o'clock. Two o'clock, half past two, every night. But now they say that this new licensing act will close every public house in this town at eleven o'clock, and a straight up eleven at that. But what do you do it for? What do we do it for? We do it to pass the time and the glass, young sir. Nor not as I should like you to think as I ever drank, Mr. Edwin. One quart of ale I take every night, and have ever done, no more, nor less. But Edwin's rapid, breaking voice interrupted eagerly the deep, majestic tones. "'Aren't you tired the next day? I should be.' "'Never,' said Big James. "'I get up from a bed, so fresh as a daisy, at six sharp, and I've known the nights when my bed ne'er saw me.' "'You must be strong, Mr. Yarlett, my word!' Edwin exclaimed. These revelations of the habits and prowess of Big James astounded him. He never suspected that such things went on in the town. "'Aye, middling.' "'I suppose it's as free and easy at the Dragon tonight, Mr. Yarlett?' "'In a manner of speaking,' said Big James. "'Wish I could stay for it.' "'Why not?' Big James suggested, and looked down at Edwin with half-humorous incertitude. Edwin shrugged his shoulders superiorly. 
indicating by instinct, in spite of himself, that possibly Big James was trespassing over the social line that divided them. And yet Big James's father would have condescended to Edwin's grandfather. Only Edwin now belonged to the employing class, while Big James belonged to the employed. Already Edwin, whose father had been thrashed by workmen whom a compositor would hesitate to call skilled, already Edwin had the mere natural to a ruler, and Big James, with dignified deference, would submit unresentingly to his attitude. It was the subtlest thing. It was not that Edwin obscurely objected to the suggestion of his being present at the free and easy. It was that he objected, but nicely and with good nature, to any assumption of Big James's right to influence him towards an act that his father would not approve. Instead of saying, why not, Big James ought to have said, nobody but you can decide that as your father's away. James ought to have been strictly impartial. 4. Well, said Big James, when they arrived at the playground, which lay north of the covered meat market, or shambles, it looks as if they hadn't been able to make a start yet at the blood tub. His tone was marked by a calm, grand disdain, as of one entertainer talking about another. The blood tub, otherwise known as Snags's, was the centre of nocturnal pleasure in Bursley. It stood almost on the very spot where the jawbone of a whale had once lain, as a supreme natural curiosity. It represented the softened manners which had developed out of the old medievalism of the century. It had supplanted the bear pit and the cockpit. It corresponded somewhat with the ideals symbolised by the new town hall. In the tiny, odorous beer-houses of all the undulating, twisting, reddish streets that surrounded the contiguous open spaces of Duck Bank, the playground, the market-place, and St. Luke's Square, the folk no longer discussed eagerly what chance on Sunday morning the municipal bear would have against five dogs. They had progressed as far as a free library, boxing gloves, rabbit coursing, and the blood tub. This last was a theatre with wooden sides and a canvas roof, and it would hold quite a crowd of people. In front of it was a platform, and an orchestra, lighted by oil flares, that, as Big James and Edwin approached, were gaining strength in the twilight. Leaning against the platform was a blackboard, on which was chalked the announcement of two plays, The Forty Thieves, author unstated, and Cruikshank's The Bottle. The orchestra, after terrific concussions, fell silent, and then a troop of players in costume, cramped on the narrow trestle boards, performed a sample scene from the Forty Thieves, just to give the crowd in front an idea of the wonders of this powerful work. And four thieves passed and repassed behind the screen hiding the doors, and reappeared nine times as four fresh thieves until the tale of Forty was complete. And then old Hammerad, the beloved clown who played the drum, and whose wife kept a barber's shop in Buck Row and shaved for a penny, left his drum and did two minutes stiff clowning, and then the orchestra burst forth again, and the brazen voice of old Snags, in his moleskin waistcoat, easily rode the storm, abjuring the folk to walk up and walk up, which some of the folk did do. And lastly the band played God Save the Queen, and the players, followed by old Snags, processionally entered the booth. "'I lay they come out again,' said Big James, with grim blandness. "'Why?' asked Edwin. He was absolutely new to the scene. "'I lay they haven't got twenty couple inside,' said Big James. And in less than a minute the troop did indeed emerge, and old Snags expostulated with the dilatory public respectfully but firmly. It had been a queer year for Mr. Snags. Rain had ruined the wakes. Rain had ruined everything. Rain had nearly ruined him. July was obviously not a month in which a self-respecting theatre ought to be open, but Mr. Snaggs had got to the point of catching at straws. He stated that in order to prove his absolute bona fides, the troupe would now give a scene from that world-renowned and unique drama, The Bottle, after which the performance really would commence, since he could not as a gentleman keep his kind patrons within waiting any longer. His habit, which emphasised itself as he grew older, was to treat the staring crowd in front of his booth like a family of nephews and nieces. The device was quite useless, for the public's stolidity was impregnable. It touched the heroic. No more granitic and crass stolidity could have been discovered in England. The 
crowd stood. It exercised no other function of existence. It just stood, and there it would stand until convinced that the gratis part of the spectacle was positively at an end. 5. With a ceremonious gesture, signifying that he assumed the young sir's consent, Big James turned away. He had displayed to Edwin the poverty and the futility of the blood-tub. Edwin would perhaps have liked to stay. The scenes enacted on the outer platform were certainly tinged with the ridiculous, but they were the first histrionics that he had ever witnessed, and he could not help thinking, hoping, in spite of his common sense, that within the booth all was different, miraculously transformed into the grand and the impressive. Left to himself, he would surely have preferred an evening at the blood-tub to a business interview with Mr. Enoch Peake at the Dragon. But naturally he had to scorn the blood-tub with a scorn equal to the massive and silent scorn of Big James. And on the whole he considered that he was behaving as a man, with another man, rather well. He sought, by deprecatory remarks, to keep the conversation at his proper adult level. Big James led him through the marketplace, where a few vegetable, tripe and gingerbread stalls, relics of the day's market, were still attracting customers in the twilight. These slatternly and picturesque groups, beneath their flickering yellow flares, were encamped at the gigantic foot of the town hall porch, as at the foot of a precipice. The monstrous black walls of the town hall rose and were merged in gloom, and the spire of the town hall, on whose summit stood a gold angel holding a gold crown, rose right into the heavens, and was there lost. It was marvellous that this town, by adding stone to stone, had upreared this monument, which, in expressing the secret nobility of its ideals, dwarfed the town. On every side of it the beer-houses, full of a dulled, savage ecstasy of life, gleamed brighter than the shops. Big James led Edwin down through the mysteries of the cockyard, and up along Bug's gutter, and so back to the dragon. End of Volume 1, Chapter 9Volume 1, Chapter 10 of Clayhanger by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume 1, Chapter 10 Free and Easy. When Edwin, shyly, followed Big James into the assembly room of the Dragon, it already held a fair sprinkling of men, and newcomers continued to drop in. They were soberly and respectably clothed, though a few had knotted handkerchiefs round their necks instead of collars and ties. The occasion was a jollity of the Bursley Mutual Burial Club. This club, a singular example of that dogged private cooperative enterprise which so sharply distinguishes English corporate life from the corporate life of other European countries, had lustily survived from a period when men were far less sure of a decent burial than they were then, in the very prosperous early seventies. It had helped to maintain the barbaric fashion of ostentatiously expensive funerals, out of which undertakers and beer-sellers made vast sums, but it had also provided a basis of common endeavour, and of fellowship. And its respectability was intense, and at the same time broad-minded. To be an established subscriber to the burial club was evidence of good character and of social spirit. The periodic jollities of this company of men whose professed aim was to bury each other had a high reputation for excellence. Up till a year previously they had always been held at the Duck, in Duck Square, opposite. But Mr. Enoch Peake, chairman of the club, had, by persistent and relentless chicane, triumphing over immense influences, changed their venue to the Dragon, whose landlady, Mrs. Louisa Loggerheads, he was then courting. It must be stated that Mrs. Louisa's name contained no slur of cantankerousness. It is merely the local word for a harmless plant, the knapweed. He had now won Mrs. Loggerheads, after being a widower thrice, and with her the second-best house in the town. There were long benches down the room with forms on either side of them. Big James, not without pomp, escorted a blushing Edwin to the end of one of these tables, near a small raised platform that occupied the extremity of the room. Over this platform was printed a legend, As a bird is known by its note, and over the legend was a full-rigged ship in a glass case, and a pair of antlers. The walls of the room were dark brown, the ceiling grey with soot of various sorts, 
and the floor tiled red and black and sanded. Smoke rose in spars from about a score of churchwarden pipes and as many cutties, which were charged from tin pouches and lighted by spills of newspaper from the three double gas-jets that hung down over the benches. Two middle-aged women, one in black and the other checked, served beer, porter and stout in mugs, and gin in glasses, passing in and out through a side door. The company talked little, and it had not yet begun seriously to drink, but, sprawled about in attitudes of restful of beds, it was smoking religiously, and the flat noise of solemn expectorations punctuated the minutes. Edwin was easily the youngest person present. The average age appeared to be about fifty, but nobody's curiosity seemed to be much stirred by his odd arrival, and he ceased gradually to blush. When, however, one of the women paused before him in silent question, and he had to explain that he required no drink, because he had only called for a moment about a matter of business, he blushed again vigorously. 2. Then Mr. Enoch Peake appeared. He was a short, stout old man, with fat hands, a red, minutely wrinkled face, and very small eyes, greeted with the respect due to the owner of Cocknage Gardens, a sporting resort where all the best foot-racing and rabbit-coursing took place, he accepted it in somnolent indifference, and immediately took off his coat and sat down in cotton shirt-sleeves. Then he pulled out a red handkerchief and his tobacco-box and set them down on the table. Big James motioned to Edwin. "'Evening, Mr. Peake,' said Big James, crossing the floor. "'And here's a young gent with for, for two words with you.' Mr. Peake stared vacantly. "'Young Mr. Clayhanger!' exclaimed Big James. "'It's, it's about this card,' Edwin began in a whisper, drawing the wedding card sheepishly from his pocket. "'Father had to go to Manchester,' he added, when he had finished. Mr. Enoch Peake seized the card in both hands and examined it, and Edwin could hear his heavy breathing. Mrs. Louisa Loggerheads, a comfortable, smiling, administrative woman of fifty, showed herself at the service door, and nodded with dignity to a few of the habitués. "'Missus is at door,' said Big James to Mr. Peake. "'Yes, sir,' muttered Mr. Peake, not interrupting his examination of the card. One of the serving women, having removed Mr. Peake's coat, brought a new churchwarden, filled it, and carefully directed the tip towards his tight little mouth. The lips closed on it. Then she lighted a spill and applied it to the distant bowl, and the mouth puffed, and then the woman deposited the bowl cautiously on the bench. Lastly, she came with a small glass of slow gin. Mr. Peake did not move. At length Mr. Peake withdrew the pipe from his mouth, and after an interval said, "'Aye!' He continued to stare at the card, now held in one hand. "'And is it to be printed in silver?' Edwin asked. Mr. Peake took a few more puffs. "'Aye!' When he had stared further for a long time at the card, his hand moved slowly with it towards Edwin, and Edwin resumed possession of it. Mrs. Louisa Loggerheads had now vanished. "'Missus has gone,' said Big James. "'Has he?' muttered Mr. Peake. Edwin rose to leave, though unwillingly, but Big James asked him in polite reproach whether he should not stay for the first song. He nodded, encouraged, and sat down. He did not know that the uppermost idea in Big James's mind for an hour past had been that Edwin would hear him sing. Mr. Peake lifted his glass, held it from him, approached his lips towards it, and emptied it at a draught. He then glanced round and said thickly, "'Gentlemen all, Mrs. Smallrice, Mrs. Eretley's, Mr. Rampick, and Mr. Yarlett, will now oblige with one of their old favourites. There was some applause. A few coats were removed, and Mr. Peake fixed himself in a contemplative attitude. 3. Messrs. Arthur Smallrice, Abraham Harrotlees, Joe Rawnpike, and James Yarlett rose, stepped heavily onto the little platform, and stood in a line with their hands in their pockets. As a bird is known by its note, was hidden by the rampart of their shoulders. They had no music. They knew the music. They had sung it a thousand times. They knew precisely the effects which they wished to produce, and the means of production. They worked together like an inspired machine. Mr. Arthur Smallrice gave a rapid glance into a corner, 
and from that corner a concertina spoke, one short note. Then began, with no hesitating shuffling preliminaries nor mute consultations, the singing of that classic quartet, justly celebrated from Hull to Wigan and from Northallerton to Lichfield, Loud Ocean's Roar. The thing was performed with absolute assurance and perfection. Mr. Martha Smallrice did the yapping of the short waves or the foam-filled rocks, and Big James, in fullest grandeur, did the long and mighty rolling of the deep. It was majestic, terrific, and overwhelming. Many bars before the close, Ebin was thrilled, as by an exquisite and vast revelation. He tingled from head to foot. He had never heard any singing like it, or any singing in any way comparable to it. He had never guessed that song held such possibilities of emotion. The pure and fine essential qualities of the voices, the dizzying harmonies, the fugal calls and responses, the strange relief of the unisons, and above all the free, natural mien of the singers, proudly aware that they were producing something beautiful that could not be produced more beautifully, conscious of unchallenged supremacy. All this enfevered him to an unprecedented and self-astonished enthusiasm. He murmured under his breath as loud ocean's roar died away, and the little voices of the street supervened. By gad! By gad! The applause was generous. Edwin stamped and clapped with childlike violence and fury. Mr. Peake slowly and regularly thumped one fist on the bench, puffing the while. Glasses and mugs could be seen, but not heard, dancing. Mr. Arthur Smallrice, Mr. Abraham Harrodlees, Mr. Jos Rawnpike, and Mr. James Yarlett, entirely inattentive to the acclamations, stepped heavily from the platform and sat down. When Edwin caught Big James's eye, he clapped again, reanimating the general approval, and Big James gazed at him with bland satisfaction. Mr. Enoch Peake was now, save for the rise and fall of his great chest, as immobile and brooding as an Indian god. 4. Edwin did not depart. He reflected that, even if his father should come home earlier than the last train and prove curious, it would be impossible for him to know the exact moment at which his son had been able to have speech with Mr. Enoch Peake on the important matter of business. For aught his father could ever guess, he might have been prevented from obtaining the attention of the chairman of the proceedings until, say, eleven o'clock. Also, he meant to present his conduct to his father in the light of an enterprising and fearless action showing a marked aptitude for affairs. Mr. Enoch Peake, whom his father was anxious to flatter, had desired his father's company at the Dragon, and, to save the situation, Edwin had courageously gone instead. That was it. Besides, he would have stayed in any case. His mind was elevated above the fear of consequences. There was some concertina playing, with a realistic imitation of church bells borne on the wind from a distance, and then the Bursley Prize hand-bell ringers, or campanologists, produced a whole family of real bells from under a form, and the ostler and the two women arranged a special table, and the campanologists fixed their bells on it and themselves round it, and performed a selection of Scotch and Irish airs, without once deceiving themselves as to the, price, as to the precise note which a chosen bell would emit when duly shaken. Singular as was this feat, it was far less so than a young man's performance of the Offitlide, a serpentine instrument that coiled round and about its player, and when breathed into persuasively, gave forth prodigious brassy sounds that resembled the night noises of beasts of prey. This item roused the Indian god from his umbilical contemplations, and as the young Ophitlai player, somewhat breathless, passed down the room with his brazen creature in his arms, Mr. Enoch Peake pulled him by the jacket-tail. "'Eh,' said Mr. Enoch Peake, "'is that the Ophitlai as thy father used to play at the old church?' Uh, "'Yes, Mr. Peake,' said the young man, with bright respect. Mr. Peake dropped his eyes again, and when the young man had gone, he murmured to his stomach, "'I well knowed it were the office leaders his father used to play at the old church.' And suddenly starting up, he continued hoarsely, "'Gentlemen all, Mr. James Yarlett will now kindly oblige with the miller of the day.' And one of the women relighted his pipe and served him with beer. 5. Big James' rendering of the miller of the day had been renowned in the five towns since 1852. It was classical, hallowed. 
It was the only possible rendering of the Miller of the Dee. If the greatest bass in the world had come incognito to Bursley and sung the Miller of the Dee, people would have said, "'Ah, but you should hear Big James sing it.' It suited Big James. The sentiments of the song were his sentiments. He expressed them with natural simplicity, but at the same time they underwent a certain refinement at his hands. For even when he sang at his loudest, Big James was refined, natty, and restrained. His instinctive gentlemanliness was invincible and all-pervading, and the real beauty and enormous power of his magnificent voice saved him by its mere distinction from the charge of being finicking. The simple sound of the voice gave pleasure, and the simple production of that sound was Big James's deepest joy. Amid all the expected loud applause, the giant looked naively for Edwin's boyish, mad enthusiasm, and felt it, and was thrilled, and very glad that he had brought Edwin. As for Edwin, Edwin was humbled that he should have been so blind to what Big James was. He had always regarded Big James as a dull, decent, somewhat peculiar fellow in a dirty apron, who was his father's foreman. He had actually talked once to Big James of the wonderful way in which Maggie and Clara sang, and Big James had been properly respectful. But the singing of Maggie and Clara was less than nothing, the crudest amateurism, compared to these public performances of Big James's. Even the accompanying concertina was far more cleverly handled than the clayhanger piano had ever been handled. Yes, Edwin was humbled, and he had a great wish to be able to do something brilliantly himself, he knew not what. The intoxication of the desire for glory was upon him, as he sat amid those shirt-sleeved men, near the brooding Indian god, under a crawling bluish canopy of smoke, gazing absently at the legend, as a bird is known by its note. After an interval, during which Mr. Enoch Peake was roused more than once, a man with a Lancashire accent recited a poem entitled The Patent Hairbrushing Machine, the rotary hairbrush being at that time an exceedingly piquant novelty that had only been heard of in the barber's shops of the five towns, though travellers to Manchester could boast that they had sat under it. As the principle of the new machine was easily grasped, and the sensations induced by it easily imagined, the recitation had a success which was indicated by slappings of thighs and great blowings off of mirth. But Mr. Enoch Peake preserved his tranquillity throughout it, and immediately it was over he announced with haste, "'Gentlemen all, Miss Florence Simcox, or should I say Mrs. Offlaw, wife of the gentleman who was just obliged, the champion female clog dancer of the Midlands, will now oblige.' Six. These words put every man whom they surprised into a state of unusual animation, and they surprised most of the company. It may be doubted whether a female clog-dancer had ever footed it in Bursley. Several public-houses possessed local champions, of a street, of a village, but these were emphatically not women. Enoch Peake had arranged this daring item in the course of his afternoon's business at Cocknage Gardens, Mr. Offlow being an expert in ratting terriers and Mrs. Offlow happened to be on a tour with her husband through the realms of her championship, a tour which mingled the varying advantages derivable from terriers, recitations, and clogs. The affair was therefore respectable beyond Cavill. Nevertheless, when Florence shone suddenly at the service door, the shortness of her red and black velvet skirts, and the undeniable complete visibility of her rounded calves, produced an uneasy and agreeable impression that Enoch Peake, for a chairman of the Mutual Burial Club, had gone rather far, superbly far, and that his moral ascendancy over Louisa Loggerheads must indeed be truly astonishing. Louisa now stood gravely behind the dancer in the shadow of the doorway, and the contrast between her and Florence was in every way striking enough to prove what a wonderful and mysterious man Enoch Peake was. Florence was accustomed to audiences. She was a pretty doll-like woman, if inclined to amplitude, but the smile between those shaking golden ringlets had neither the modesty nor the false modesty nor the docility that Bursley was accustomed to think proper to the face of woman. He could have stared down any man in the place, except perhaps Mr. Peake. The gestures of Mr. Offlow, and her gestures, as he arranged and prepared the surface of the little square dancing board that was her throne, showed that he was the husband of Florence Simcox, rather than she the wife of Offlow, the reciter and dog-fancier. Further, it was his role to play the concertina to her. 
he'd had to learn the concertina, possibly a secret humiliation for one whose judgment in terriers was not excelled in many public houses. 7. She danced, and the service doorway showed a vista of open-mouthed scullions. There was no sound in the room save the concertina and the champion clogs. Every eye was fixed on those clogs. Even the little eyes of Mr. Peake quitted the button of his waistcoat and burned like diamond points on those clogs. Florence herself chiefly gazed on those clogs, but occasionally her nonchalant, petulant gaze would wander up and down her bare arms and across her bosom. At intervals, with her ringed fingers, she would lift the short skirt, a nothing, an imperceptibility, half an inch, with glance downcast, and the effect was profound, recondite, inexplicable. Her style was not that of a male clog-dancer, but it was indubitably clog-dancing, full of marvels to the connoisseur, and to the profane naught but a highly complicated series of wooden noises. Florence's face began to perspire. Then the concertina ceased playing, so that an undistracted attention might be given to the supremely difficult final figures of the dance. And thus was rendered back to the people, in the charming form of beauty, that which the instinct of the artist had taken from the sordid ugliness of the people. The clog, the very emblem of the servitude and the squalor of brutalised populations, was changed, on the light feet of this favourite, into the medium of grace. Few of these men but at some time of their lives had worn the clog, had clattered in it through winter's slush, and through the freezing darkness before dawn, to the manufactory and the mill and the mine, whence, after a day of labour under discipline more than military, they had clattered back to their little candle-lighted homes. One of the slattens behind the doorway actually stood in clogs to watch the dancer. The clog meant everything that was harsh, foul, and desolating. It summoned images of misery and disgust. Yet on those feet, that had never worn it seriously, it became the magic instrument of pleasure, waking to dulled wits and forgotten aspirations, putting upon everybody an enchantment. And then suddenly the dancer threw up one foot as high as her head and brought two clogs down together like a double mallet on the board, and stood still. It was over. Mrs. Louisa Loggerheads turned nervously away, pushing her servants in front of her. And when the society of mutual barriers had recovered from the startling, shameless insolence of that last high kick, he gave the rein to its panting excitement and roared and stamped. Edwin was staggered. The blood swept into his face a hot tide. He was ravished, but he was also staggered. He did not know what to think of Florence, the champion female clog-dancer. He felt that she was wondrous. He felt that he could have gazed at her all night but he felt that she had put him under the necessity of reconsidering some of his fundamental opinions. For example, he was obliged to admit within himself a lessening of scorn for the attitude toward each other of Miss Ingemell's and her young man. He saw those things in a new light, and he reflected, dazzled by the unforeseen changes of existence, "'Yesterday I was at school, and today I see this.' He was so preoccupied by his own intimate sensations that the idea of applauding never occurred to him, until he perceived his conspicuousness in not applauding, whereupon he clapped self-consciously. 8. Miss Florence Simcox, somewhat breathless, tripped away, with simulated coyness and many curtsies. She had done her task, and as a woman she had to go. This was a gathering of members of the Mutual Burial Club, a masculine company, and not meet for females. The men pulled themselves together, remembering that their proudest quality was a stoic callousness that nothing could overthrow. They refilled pipes, ordered more beer, and resumed the mask of invulnerable solemnity. "'Aye,' muttered Mr. Enoch Peake. Edwin, with a great effort, rose and walked out. He would have liked to say good-night to Big James. He did not deny that he ought to have done so, but he dared not complicate his exit." On the pavement outside, in the warm, damp night, a few loitering listeners stood doggedly before an open window, hearkening, their hands deep in their pockets, motionless. And Edward could hear Mr. Enoch Peake. "'Gentlemen all, Mr. Arthur Smallrice, Mr. Abraham Harracles, Mr. Joel Rampick, and Mr. James Yarlett.' 
End of Volume 1, Chapter 10volume 1 chapter 11 of clayhanger by arnold bennett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by simon evers volume 1 chapter 11 son and father later that evening edwin sat at a small deal table in the embrasure of the dormer window of the empty attic next to his bedroom during the interval between tea and the rendezvous with big james he had formally planted his flag in that room he had swept it out with a long brush, while Clara stood at the door giggling at the spectacle, and telling him that he had no right thus to annex territory in the absence of the overlord. He had mounted a pair of steps, and put a lot of lumber through a trap at the head of the stairs into the loft, and he had got a table, a lamp, and a chair. That was all he needed for the moment. He had gone out to meet Big James with his head quite half full of this vague attic project, but the night sights of Bursley, and especially the music of the dragon, and still more especially the dancing at the dragon, had almost expelled the attic project from his head. When he returned unobtrusively into the house, and learned from a disturbed Mrs. Nixon, who was sewing in the kitchen, that he was understood to be in his new attic, and that his sisters had gone to bed, the enchantment of the attic had instantly resumed much of its power over him, and he had hurried upstairs, fortified with a slice of bread and half a cold sausage. He had eaten the food absently in gulps, while staring at the corner of Casanova's architectural views of the European capitals, abstracted from the shop without payment. Then he had pinned part of a sheet of cartridge paper on an old drawing-board which he possessed, and had sat down. For his purpose the paper ought to have been soaked and stretched on the board with paste, but that would have meant a delay of seven or eight hours, and he was not willing to wait. Though he could not concentrate his mind to begin, his mind could not be reconciled to waiting. So he had decided to draw his picture in pencil outline, and then stretch the paper early on Sunday morning. It would dry during chapel. His new box of paints, a cracked T-square, and some India rubber also lay on the table. He had chosen View of the Cathedral of Notre-Dame Paris from the Pont des Arts. It pleased him by the coloration of the old houses in front of Notre-Dame, and the reflections in the water of the Seine, and the elusive blueness of the twin towers amid the pale grey clouds of a Parisian sky. A romantic scene. He wanted to copy it exactly, to recreate it from beginning to end, to feel the thrill of producing each wonderful effect himself. Yet he sat inactive. He sat and vaguely gazed at the slope of Trafalgar Road with its double row of yellow jewels, beautifully ascending in fire to the ridge of the horizon, and there losing itself in the deep and solemn purple of the summer night. And he thought how ugly and commonplace all that was, and how different from all that were the noble capitals of Europe. Scarcely a sound came through the open window. Songs doubtless still gushed forth at the dragon, and revellers would not for hours awake the street on their way to the exacerbating atmosphere of home. He had no resolution to take up the pencil. Yet, after the mailed Lee party had sung, Loud Ocean's Roar, he remembered that he had a most clear and distinct impulse to begin drawing architecture at once, and to do something grand and fine, as grand and fine as the singing, something that would thrill people as the singing thrilled. If he had not rushed home instantly, it was solely because he had been held back by the strong desire to hear more music, by the hope of further novel and exciting sensations. But Florence the clog-dancer had easily diverted the seeming powerful current of his mind. He wanted as much as ever to do wondrous things, and to do them soon, but it appeared to him that he must think out first the enigmatic subject of Florence. Never had he seen any female creature as he saw her, and ephemeral images of her were continually forming and dissolving before him. He could come to no conclusion at all about the subject of Florence. Only his boyish pride was gradually being beaten back by an oncoming idea that up to that very evening he had been a sort of rather silly kid with no eyes in his head. It was in order to ignore for a time this unsettling and humiliating idea that finally he began to copy the outlines of the Parisian scene on his cartridge paper. He was in no way a skilled draughtsman, 
but he had dabbled in pencils and colours, and he had lately picked up from a handbook the hint that in blocking out a drawing the first thing to do was to observe what points were vertically under what points, and what points horizontal with what points. He seemed to see the whole secret of draughtsmanship in this priceless counsel, which indeed, with an elementary knowledge of geometry acquired at school, and the familiarity of his fingers with a pencil, constituted the whole of his technical equipment. All the rest was mere desire. Happily, the architectural nature of the subject made it more amenable than, say, a rural landscape, to the use of a T-square and common sense. And Edmund considered that he was doing rather well, until, quitting measurement and rulings, he arrived at the stage of drawing the detail of the towers. Then at once the dream of perfect accomplishment began to fade at the edges, and the crust of faith to yield ominously. Each stroke was a falling away from the ideal, a blow to hope. And suddenly a yawn surprised him, and recalled him to the existence of his body. He thought, "'I can't really be tired. It would be absurd to go to bed.' For his theory had long been that the notions of parents about bedtime were indeed absurd, and that he would be just as thoroughly reposed after three hours' sleep as after ten. And now that he was a man, he meant to practice his theory, so far as circumstances allowed. He looked at his watch. It was turned half-past eleven. A delicious wave of joy and of satisfaction animated him. He had never been up so late, within his recollection, save on a few occasions when even infants were allowed to be up late. He was alone, secreted, master of his time and his activity, his mind charged with novel impressions and a congenial work in progress. Alone? It was as if he was spiritually alone in the vast solitude of the night. It was as if he could behold the unconscious forms of all humanity sleeping. This feeling that only he had preserved consciousness and energy, that he was the sole active possessor of the mysterious night, affected him in the most exquisite manner. He had not been so nobly happy in his life, and at the same time he was proud, in a childlike way, of being up so late. 3. He heard the door being pushed open, and he gave a jump and turned his head. His father stood in the entrance to the attic. "'Hello, father,' he said weakly, ingratiatingly. "'What art doing at this dumb night, lad?' Darius Clayhanger demanded. Strange to say, the autocrat was not angered by the remarkable sight in front of him. Ibby knew that his father would probably come home from Manchester on the mail train, which would stop to set down a passenger at Shawport by suitable arrangement. And he had expected that his father would go to bed, as usual on such evenings, after having eaten the supper left for him in the sitting-room. His father's bedroom was next door to the sitting-room. Save for Mrs. Nixon in a distant nook, Edwin had the attic floor to himself. He ought to have been as safe from intrusion there as in the farthest capital of Europe. His father did not climb the attic stairs once in six months, so that he had regarded himself as secure. Still, he must have positively forgotten the very existence of his father. He must have been lost— "'otherwise he could not but have heard the footsteps on the stairs. "'I was just drawing,' said Edwin, with a little more confidence. "'He looked at his father, and saw an old man, "'a man who for him had always been old, "'generally harsh, often truculent, and seldom indulgent. "'He saw an ugly, undistinguished, and somewhat vulgar man, "'far less dignified, for instance, than Big James, "'a man who had his way by force, and scarcely ever by argument.' a man whose arguments for or against a given course were simply pitiable, if not despicable. He sometimes indeed thought that there must be a peculiar twist in his father's brain which prevented him from appreciating an adverse point in a debate. He had ceased to expect that his father would listen to reason. Latterly he was always surprised when, as to-night, he caught a glimpse of mild benevolence on that face. Yet he would never fail to respond to such a mood eagerly, without resentment. It might be said that he regarded his father as he regarded the weather, fatalistically. No more than against the weather would he have dreamed of bearing malice against his father, even had such a plan not been unwise and dangerous. He was convinced that his father's interest in him 
was about the same as the son's interest in him. His father was nearly always wrapped in business affairs, and seemed to come to the trifling affairs of Edwin with difficulty, as out of an absorbing engrossment. Assuredly, he would have been amazed to know that his father had been thinking of him all the afternoon and evening. But it was so. Darius Clayhanger had been nervous as to the manner in which the boy would acquit himself in the bit of business which had been confided to him. It was the boy's first bit of business. Straightforward as it was, the boy might muddle it, might omit a portion of it, might say the wrong thing, might forget. Darius hoped for the best, but he was afraid. He saw in his son an amiable, irresponsible fool. He compared Edwin at sixteen with himself at the same age. Edwin had never had a care, never suffered a privation, never been forced to think for himself. Darius might more justly have put it, never been allowed to think for himself. Edwin had lived in cotton wool, and knew less of the world than his father had known at half his years, much less. Darius was sure that Edwin had never even come near suspecting the miracles which his father had accomplished. This was true, and not merely was Edwin stupendously ignorant, and even pettily scornful, of realities, but he was ignorant of his own ignorance. Education! Darius snorted. To Darius it seemed that Edwin's education was like lying down in an orchard in lovely summer, and having ripe fruit dropped into your mouth. A cocky infant! A girl! And yet there was something about Edwin that his father admired, even respected and envied. An occasional gesture, an attitude in walking, an intonation, a smile. Edwin, his own son, had a personal distinction that he himself could never compass. Edwin talked more correctly than his father. He thought differently from his father. He had an original grace. In the essence of his being he was superior to both his father and his sisters. Sometimes when his father saw him walking along the street, or coming into a room, or uttering some simple phrase, or shrugging his shoulders, Darius was aware of a faint thrill. Pride? Perhaps, but he would never have admitted it. An agreeable perplexity, rather, as to have been puzzled how he, so common, had begotten a creature so subtly aristocratic. Aristocratic was the word. And Edwin seemed so young, fragile, innocent, and defenceless. 4. Darius advanced into the attic. "'What about that matter of Enoch Beeks?' he asked, hoping and fearing, rather anxious for his son. He defended himself against probable disappointment by preparing to lapse into savage paternal pessimism and disgust at the futility of an offspring nursed in luxury. "'Oh, it's all right,' said Edwin eagerly. "'Mr. Peake sent word he couldn't come, and he wanted you to go across to the dragon this evening. So I went instead.' It sounded dashingly capable. He finished the recital, and added that of course Big James had not been able to proceed with the job. "'And where's the proof?' demanded Darius. His relief expressed itself in a superficial surliness, but Edwin was not deceived. As his father gazed mechanically at the proof that Edwin produced hurriedly from his pocket, he added with a negligent air, "'There was a free and easy at the dragon, father.' Moser, muttered Darius. Edwin saw that whatever danger had existed was now over. "'And I suppose,' said Darius, with assumed grimness, "'if I hadn't happened to have seen a light from the bottom of the attic stairs, "'I should have never known aught about all this here.' "'He indicated the cleansed attic, the table, the lamp, and the apparatus of art. "'Oh, yes, you would, father,' Edwin reassured him. "'Darius came nearer. "'They were close together. "'Edwin twisted on the cane chair, and his father almost over him. "'The lamp smelt and gave off a stuffy warmth.' The open window through which came a wandering air was a black oblong. The triangular side walls of the dormer shut them intimately in. The house slept. What are up to? The tone was benignant. Ebbett had not been ordered abruptly off to bed with a reprimand for late hours and silly proceedings generally. He sought the reason in vain. One reason was that Darius Clearhanger had made a grand bargain at Manchester the purchase of a second-hand printing-machine. 
"'I'm copying this,' he replied slowly, and then all the details tumbled rashly out of his mouth, one after the other. "'Oh, father, I found this book in the shop, packed away on a top shelf, and I want to borrow it. I only want to borrow it. And I bought this paint-box out of Auntie's half-sovereign. I paid Miss Ingemel's the full price. I thought I'd have a go at some of these architecture things.' Darius glanced at the copy. Hm. "'It's only just started, you know.' "'Them prize-books. Have you done all that?' "'Yes, father.' "'And put all the prices down, as I told you?' "'Yes, father.' Then a pause. Edwin's heart was beating hard. "'I wanted to do some of these architecture things,' he repeated. No remark from his father. Then he said, fastening his gaze intensely on the table, "'You know, father, what I should really like to be, I should like to be an architect.' It was out. He had said it. "'Should ye?' said his father, who attached no importance of any kind to this avowal of a preference. "'Well, what you want is a bit of business training for a start, I'm thinking.' "'Oh, of course,' Eben concurred with pathetic eagerness, and added a piece of information for his father. "'I'm only sixteen, aren't I?' Sixteen ought to have been in bed this two hours or more. Off with ye!' Edwin retired in an extraordinary state of relief and happiness. End of Volume 1, Chapter 11volume 1 chapter 12 of clayhanger by arnold bennett this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by simon evers volume 1 chapter 12 machinery rather more than a week later edwin had so far entered into the life of his father's business that he could fully share the excitement caused by an impending solemnity in the printing office he was somewhat pleased with himself and especially with his seriousness the memory of school was slipping away from him in the most extraordinary manner. His only school friend, Charlie Orgreave, had departed, with all the multitudinous Orgreaves, for a month in Wales. He might have written to The Sunday. The Sunday might have written to him. But the idea of writing did not occur to either of them. They were both still sufficiently childlike to accept with fatalism all the consequences of parental caprice. Orgreave Senior had taken his family to Wales. The boys were thus separated— and there was an end to it. Edwin regretted this because Orgreave Senior happened to be a very successful architect, and hence there were possibilities of getting into an architectural atmosphere. He had never been inside the home of the Sunday, nor the Sunday in his. A schoolboy friendship can flourish in perfect independence of home. But he nervously hoped that on the return of the Orgreave Regiment from Wales, something favourable to his ambitions, he knew not what, would come to pass. In the meantime he was conscientiously doing his best to acquire a business training, as his father had suggested. He gave himself, with an enthusiasm almost religious, to the study of business methods. All the force of his resolve to perfect himself went for the moment into this immediate enterprise, and he was sorry that business methods were not more complex, mysterious, and original than they seemed to be. He was also sorry that his father did not show a greater interest in his industry and progress. He no longer wanted to play now. He despised play. His unique wish was to work. It struck him as curious and delightful that he really enjoyed work. Work had indeed become play. He could not do enough work to satisfy his appetite. And after the work of the day, scorning all silly notions about exercise and relaxation, he would spend the evening in his beautiful new attic copying designs, which he would sometimes rise early to finish. He thought he had conquered the gross body, and that it was of no account. Even the desolating failures which his copies invariably proved did not much discourage him. Besides, one of them had impressed both Maggie and Clara. He copied with laborious ardour undiminished. And further, he masterfully appropriated Maggie's ticket for the free library, pending the preliminaries to the possession of a ticket of his own, to procure a volume on architecture. From timidity, from a singular false shame, he kept this volume in the attic like a crime. Nobody knew what the volume was. Evidence of a strange trait in his character, a trait perhaps not defensible. He argued with himself that having told his father plainly that he wanted to be an architect, he need do nothing else aggressive for the present. He had agreed to the suggestion about business training, 
and he must be loyal to his agreement. He pointed out to himself how right his father was. At sixteen, one could scarcely begin to be an architect. It was too soon, and a good business training would not be out of place in any career or profession. He was so wrapped up in his days and his nights that he forgot to inquire why earthenware was made in just the five towns. He had grown too serious for trifles, and all in about a week. True, he was feeling the temporary excitement of the printing office, which was perhaps expressed boyishly by the printing staff. But he reckoned that his share of it was quite adult, frighteningly superior, and in a strictly business sense justifiable and even proper. 2. Darius Clayhanger's printing office was a fine example of the policy of makeshift which governed and still governs the commercial activity of the five towns. It consisted of the first floor of a nondescript building which stood at the bottom of the irregularly shaped yard behind the shop and house and which formed the southern boundary of the Clayhanger premises. The antique building had once been part of an old-fashioned potworks, but that must have been in the eighteenth century. Kilns and chimneys of all ages, sizes and tints rose behind it to prove that this part of the town was one of the old manufacturing quarters. The ground floor of the building, entirely inaccessible from Clayhanger's yard, had a separate entrance of its own in an alley that branched off from Woodison Bank, ran parallel to Wedgwood Street, and stopped abruptly at the back gate of a saddler's workshop. In the narrow entry you were like a creeping animal amid the undergrowth of a forest of chimneys, ovens, and high blank walls. This ground floor had been a stable for many years. It was now, however, a baker's storeroom. Once there had been an interior staircase leading from the ground floor to the first floor, but it had been suppressed in order to save floor space, and an exterior staircase constructed with its foot in Clayhanger's yard. To meet the requirement of the staircase, one of the first-floor windows had been transformed into a door. Further, as the staircase came against one of the ground-floor windows, and as Clayhanger's predecessor had objected to those alien windows overlooking his yard, and as numerous windows were anyhow unnecessary to a stable, all the ground-floor windows had been closed up with oddments of brick and tile, giving to the wall a very variegated and chequered appearance. Thus the ground-floor and the first-floor were absolutely divorced, the former having its entrance and light from the public alley, the latter from the private yard. The first floor had been a printing office for over seventy years. All the machinery in it had been manoeuvred up the rickety stairs, or put through one of the windows on either side of the window that had been turned into a door. When Darius Clayhanger, in his audacity, decided to print by steam, many people imagined that he would at last be compelled to rent the ground floor or to take other premises. But no, the elasticity of the makeshift policy was not fully stretched. Darius, in consultation with a jobbing builder, came happily to the conclusion that he could manage, that he could make things do, by adding to the top of his stairs a little landing for an engine shed. This was done, and the engine and boiler perched in the air. The shaft of the engine went through the wall, the chimney-piece of the boiler ran up straight to the level of the roof-ridge, and was stayed with pieces of wire. A new chimney had also been pierced in the middle of the roof, for the uses of a heating-stove. The original chimneys had been allowed to fall into decay. Finally, a new large skylight added interest to the roof. In a general way, the building resembled a suit of clothes that had been worn, during four of the seven ages of man, by an untidy husband with a tidy and economical wife, and then given by the wife to a poor relation of a somewhat different figure to finish. All that could be said of it was that it survived and served. But these considerations occurred to nobody. 3. Edwin, quite unaware that he was an instrument in the hands of his Auntie Clara's providence, left the shop without due excuse and passed down the long blue paved yard toward the printing office. He imagined that he was being drawn thither simply by his own curiosity. A curiosity, however, which he considered to be justifiable and even laudable. The yard showed signs that the unusual had lately been happening there. Its brick pavement, in the narrow branch of it that led to the double gates in Woodison Bank, those gates which said to the casual visitor, no business except on business, was muddy, littered, and damaged, as though a juggernaut had passed that way. Ladders reclined against the walls. Moreover, one of the windows of the office had been taken out of its frame, 
leaving naught but an oblong aperture. Through this aperture, Ebbing could see the busy, eager forms of his father, Big James, and Chawner. Through this aperture had been lifted, in parts and by the employment of every possible combination of lever and pulley, the printing machine which Darius Clayhanger had so successfully purchased in Manchester on the day of the free and easy at the Dragon. At the top of the flight of steps, two apprentices, one nearly out of his time, were ministering to the engine, which that morning did not happen to be running. The engine, giving glory to the entire establishment by virtue of the imposing word steam, was a crotchety and capricious thing, constant only in its tendency to break down. No more reliance could be placed on it than on a pampered donkey. Sometimes it would run, and sometimes it would not run, but nobody could safely prophesy its moods. Of the several machines it drove but one, the grand cylinder, the last triumph of the ingenuity of man, and even that had to be started by hand before the engine would consent to work it. The staff hated the engine, except during those rare hours when one of its willing moods coincided with the pressure of business. Then, when the steam was sputtering and the smoke smoking and the piston throbbing and the leathern belt travelling round and round and the complete building a tremble and a clatter and an attendant with clean hands was feeding the sheets on one end of the machine and another attendant with clean hands taking them off at the other, all at the rate of twenty copies per sixty seconds. Then the staff loved the engine, and meditated upon the wonders of their modern civilization. The engine had been known to do its five thousand in an afternoon, and its horsepower was only one. 4. Ebbing could not keep out of the printing office. He went inconspicuously, and, as it were, by accident, up the stone steps, and disappeared into the interior. When you entered the office, you were first of all impressed by the multiplicity of odours competing for your attention, the chief among these being of those of ink, oil, and paraffin. Despite the fact that the door was open and one window gone, the smell and heat in the office on that warm morning were notable. Old sheets of the Manchester Examiner had been pinned over the skylight to keep out the sun, but, as these were torn and rent, the sun was not kept out. Nobody, however, seemed to suffer inconvenience. After the odours, the remarkable feature of the place was the quantity of machinery on its uneven floor. Timid employees had occasionally suggested to Rorias that the floor might yield one day and add themselves and all the machinery to the baker's stores below. But Rorias knew the floors never did yield. In the middle of the floor was a huge and heavy heating stove, whose pipe ran straight upwards to the visible roof. The mighty cylinder machine stood to the left hand. Behind was a small, rough-and-ready binding department with a guillotine cutting machine, a cardboard cutting machine, and a perforating machine, trifles by the side of the cylinder, but still each of them formidable masses of metal heavy enough to crush a horse. The cutting machines might have served to illustrate the French Revolution, and the perforating machine the Holy Inquisition. Then there was what was called in the office the old machine, a relic of Clayhanger's predecessor, and at least eighty years old. It was one of those machines whose warm physiognomies, full of character, show at least that they have a history. In construction it carried solidity to an absurd degree. Its pillars were like the piles of a pier. Once, in a historic rat-catching, a rat had got up one of them, and a piece of smouldering brown paper had done what a terrier could not do. The machine at one period of its career had been enlarged, and the neat seeming of the metal was an ecstasy to the eye of a good workman. Long ago, it was known, this machine had printed a reform newspaper at Stockport. Now, after thus participating in the violent politics of an age heroic and unhappy, it had been put to printing small posters of auctions and tea-meetings. His movement was double, first that of a handle to bring the bed under the platen, and second a lever pulled over to make contact between the type and the paper. It still worked perfectly. It was so solid, and had been so honestly made, that it could never get out of order, nor wear away. And indeed, the conscientiousness and skill of artifers in the eighteenth century are still, through that resistless machine, producing their effect in the twentieth. But it needed a strong hand to bestir its smooth, plum-coloured limbs of metal, and a speed of a hundred an hour meant gentle perspiration. The machine was loved like an animal. 
Near this honourable and lumbering survival stood pertly an empire treadle machine for printing envelopes and similar trifles. It was new, and full of natty little devices. It worked with the lightness of something unsubstantial. A child could actuate it, and it would print delicately a thousand envelopes an hour. With the latest purchase, which was away at the other end of the room near the large double-pointed case-rack, completed the tale of machines. That case-rack alone held fifty different founts of type, and there were other case-racks. The lead-rack was nearly as large, and beneath the lead-rack was a rack containing all those furnitures which helped to hold a form of type together without betraying themselves to the reader of the printed sheet. And under the furniture-rack was the random, full of galleys. Then there was a table with a top of solid stone, upon which the forms were bolted up. And there was the ink-slab, another solidity, upon which the ink-rollers were inked. Rollers of various weightiness lay about, and large heavy cans, and many bottles, and metal galleys, and nameless fragments of metal. Everything contributed to the impression of immense ponderosity exceeding the imagination. The fancy of being pinned down by even the lightest of these constructions was excruciating. You moved about in narrow alleys among upstanding, unyielding, metallic enormities, and you felt fragile and perilously soft. 5. The only unintimidating phenomena in the crowded place were the lie-brushes, the dusty job-files that hung from the great transverse beams, and the proof-sheets that were scattered about. These printage things showed to what extent Darius Clayhanger's establishment was a channel through which the life of the town had somehow to pass. Auctions, meetings, concerts, sermons, improving lectures, miscellaneous entertainments, programmes, catalogues, deaths, births, marriages, specifications, municipal notices, summonses, demands, receipts, subscription lists, accounts, rate forms, lists of voters, jury lists, inaugurations, closures, billheads, handbills, addresses, visiting cards, society rules, bargain sales, lost and found notices. Traces of all these matters and more were to be found in that office. It was impregnated with human interest, was dusty with human interest. Its hot smell seemed to you to come off life itself, if the real sentiment and love of life were sufficiently in you. A grand, stuffy, living, seething place, with all its metallic immobility. 6. Edwin sidled towards the centre of interest, the new machine, which, however, was not a new machine. Darius Clayhanger did not buy more new things than he could help. His delight was to pick up articles that were supposed to be as good as new. Occasionally he would even assert that an object bought second-hand was better than new, because it had been broken in, as if it were a horse. Nevertheless, the latest machine was, for a printing machine, nearly new. Its age was four years only. It was a demi-Columbian press, similar in conception and movement to the historic old machine that had been through the reform agitation, but how much lighter, how much handier, how much more ingenious and precise in the detail of its working! A beautiful edifice, as it stood there, gazed on admiringly by the expert eyes of Darius, in his shirt-sleeves, Big James, in his royally flowing apron, and Chawner, the journeyman compositor, who, with the two apprentices outside, completed the staff. Aided by no mechanic more skilled than a day-labourer, those men had got the machine piecemeal into the office, and had duly erected it. At that day, a foreman had to be equal to anything. The machine appeared so majestic there, so solid and immovable, that it might ever have existed where it then was. Who could credit that, less than a fortnight earlier, it had stood equally majestic, solid and immovable in Manchester? There remained nothing to show how the miracle had been accomplished, except a bandage of ropes round the lower pillars, and some pulley-tackle hanging from one of the transverse beams exactly overhead. The situation of the machine in the workshop had been fixed partly by that beam above, and partly by the run of the beams that supported the floor. The stout roof-beam enabled the artificers to handle the great masses by means of the tackle. And as for the floor-beams, Darius had so far listened to warnings as to take them into account. 7. "'Take another impress, James.' said Jairias, and when he saw Edwin, instead of asking the youth what he was wasting his time there for, he good-humouredly added, 
Just watch this, my lad. Darius was pleased with himself, his men, and his acquisition. He was in one of his moods when he could charm. He was jolly, and he held up his chin. Two days before, so interested had he been in the demi-Columbian, he had actually gone through a bilious attack while scarcely noticing it. And now the whole complex operation had been brought to a triumphant conclusion. Big James inserted the sheet of paper with gentle and fine movements. The journeyman turned the handle, and the bed of the machine slid horizontally forward in frictionless, stately silence. And then Big James seized the lever with his hairy arm bared to the elbow and pulled it over. The delicate process was done with minute and level exactitude, adjusted to the thirty-second of an inch. The great masses of the metal had brought the paper and the type together and separated them again. In another moment Big James drew out the sheet, and the three men inspected it, each leaning over it. A perfect impression. Well, said Darius, playing, we've had a bit of luck in getting that up. Never had less trouble. Shows we can do better without those foundry chaps than with them. James, you can have a cork brought in, if you're in a mind. But well, I won't have them apprentices drinking. No, I won't. Mrs. Dixon will give them some nettle beer if they fancy it. He was benignant. The inauguration of a new machine deserved solemn recognition, especially on a hot day. It was an event. On interval in arms could turn this year, murmured the journeyman, toying with a handle that moved the bed. It was an exaggeration, but an excusable, poetical exaggeration. Big James wiped his wrists on his apron. 8. Then there was a queer sound of cracking somewhere, vague, faint, and yet formidable. Taras was standing between the machines and the dismantled window, his back to the latter. Big James and the journeyman rushed instinctively from the centre of the floor towards him. In a second the journeyman was on the window sill. "'What art doing?' Darius demanded roughly, but there was no sincerity in his voice. "'The floor!' The journeyman excitedly exclaimed. Big James stood close to the wall. And "'What about the floor?' Darius challenged him obstinately. Wh wh "'One of them beams is a-going!' stammered the journeyman. "'Rubbish!' shouted Darius. But simultaneously he motioned to Edwin to move from the middle of the floor, and Edwin obeyed. All four listened, with nerves stretched to the tightest. Darius was biting his lower lip with his upper teeth. His humour had swiftly changed to the savage. Every warning that had been uttered for years past concerning that floor was remembered with startling distinctness. Every impatient reassurance offered by Darius for years past suddenly seemed fatuous and perverse. How could any man in his senses expect the old floor to withstand such a terrific strain as that to which Darius had at last dared to subject it? The floor ought by right to have given way years ago. His men ought to have declined to obey instructions that were obviously insane. These and similar thoughts visited the minds of Big James and the journeyman. As for Edwin, his excitement was, on balance, pleasurable. In truth, he could not kill in his mind the hope that the floor would yield. The greatness of the resulting catastrophe fascinated him. He knew that he should be disappointed if the catastrophe did not occur, that it would mean ruinous damage to the extent of hundreds of pounds and enormous worry, did not influence him. His reason did not influence him, nor his personal danger. He saw a large hook in the wall to which he could cling when the exquisite crash came, and pictured a welter of broken machinery and timber ten feet below him, and the immense pother that the affair would create in the town. 9. Darius would not loose his belief in his floor. He hugged it in mute fury. He would not climb onto the window sill, nor tell Big James to do so, nor even Edwin. On the subject of the floor he was religious. He was above the appeal of the intelligence. He had always held passionately that the floor was immovable, and he always would. He had finally convinced himself of its omnipotent strength by the long process of assertion and reassertion. When a voice within him murmured that his belief in the floor had no scientific basis, he strangled the voice. So he remained, motionless between the window and the machine. No sound, no slightest sound, no tremor of the machine. But Darius's breathing could be heard after a moment. He guffawed sneeringly. "'Harm what next?' he defiantly asked, scowling. "'What's amiss with ye all?' 
He put his hands in his pockets. "'Don't you mean to tell me as—' The younger apprentice entered from the engine shed. "'Get back there!' rolled and thundered the voice of Big James. It was the first word he had spoken, he did not speak it in frantic, hysteric command, but with a terrible and convincing mildness. The phrase fell on the apprentice like a sandbag, and he vanished. Darius said nothing. There was another cracking sound, louder, and unmistakably beneath the bed of the machine. And at the same instant a flake of grimy plaster detached itself from the opposite wall and dropped into pale dust on the floor. And still Darius religiously did not move, and Big James would not move. They might have been under a spell. The journeyman jumped down incautiously into the yard. 10. And then Edwin, hardly knowing what he did, and certainly not knowing why he did it, walked quickly out onto the floor, seized the huge hook attached to the lower pulley of the tackle that hung from the roof beam, pulled up the slack of the rope bandage on the hind part of the machine, and stuck the hook into it, then walked quickly back. The hauling rope of the tackle had been carried to the iron ring of a trapdoor in the corner near Big James. This trapdoor, once the outlet of the interior staircase from the ground floor, had been nailed down many years previously. Big James dropped to his knees and tightened and knotted the rope. Another, a much louder noise of cracking followed. The floor visibly yielded, and the hind part of the machine visibly sank about a quarter of an inch. But no more. The tackle held. The strain was distributed between the beam above and the beam below, an equilibrium established. "'Out, lad, out!' cried Darius feebly, in the wreck, not of his workshop, but of his religion. And Edwin fled down the steps, pushing the mystified apprentices before him, and followed by the men. In the yard, the journeyman, entirely self-centred, was hopping about on one leg and cursing. 11. Darius, Big James and Edwin stared in the morning sunshine at the aperture of the window, and listened. "'Nay,' said Big James, after an eternity, "'he saved it. He saved the old shop. But by gum, by gum!' Darius turned to Edwin, and tried to say something. And then Edwin saw his father's face working into monstrous angular shapes, and saw the tears spurt out of his eyes, and was clutched convulsively in his father's shirt-sleeved arms. He was very proud, very pleased, but he did not like this embrace. It made him feel ashamed. He thought how Clara would have sniggered about it and caricatured it afterwards, had she witnessed it. And although he had incontestably done something which was very wonderful and very heroic, and which proved in him the most extraordinary presence of mind, he could not honestly glorify himself in his own heart, because it appeared to him that he had acted exactly like an automaton. He blankly marvelled and thought the situation agreeably thrilling, if somewhat awkward. His father let him go. Then all Edwin's feelings gave place to an immense stupefaction at his father's truly remarkable behaviour. What? His father emotional? He had to begin to revise again his settled views. End of Volume 1, Chapter 12《ボリューム1》Chapter 13 of Clayhanger by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume 1, Chapter 13. One result of courage. By the next morning, a certain tranquillity was restored. It was only in this relative calm that the Clayhanger family and its dependents began to realize the intensity of the experience through which they had passed, and, in particular, the strain of waiting for events after the printing office had been abandoned by its denizens. The rumour of what had happened, and of what might have happened, had spread about the premises in an instant, and in another instant all the women had collected in the yard. Even Miss Ingemell's had betrayed the sacred charge of the shop. Ten people were in the yard, staring at the window aperture on the first floor, and listening for ruin. Some time had elapsed before Darius would allow anybody even to mount to the steps. Then the baker, the tenant of the ground floor, had had to be fetched. A pleasant, bland man, he had consented in advance to every suggestion. He had practically made Darius a present of the ground floor, if Darius possessed the courage to go into it, or to send others into it. The seat of deliberation had then been transferred to the alley behind, 
and the jobbing builder and carpenters had been fetched, and there was a palaver of tremendous length and solemnity. For hours nothing definite seemed to happen. No one ate or drank, and the current of life at the corner of Trafalgar Road and Wedgwood Street ceased to flow. Boys and men who had heard of the affair, and who had the divine gift of curiosity, gazed in rapture at the no-admittance notice on the ramshackle double gates in Woodison Bank. It seemed that they might never be rewarded, but their great faith was justified when a handcart, bearing several beams three yards long, halted at the gates, and was, after a pause, laboriously pushed past them and round the corner into the alley and up the alley. The alley had been crammed to witness the taking of the beams into the baker's storeroom. If the floor above had decided to yield, the noble, legitimate carpenters would have been crushed beneath tons of machinery. At length a forest of pillars stood planted on the ground floor amid the baker's lumber. Every beam was duly supported, and the experts pronounced that a calamity was now inconceivable. Lastly, the tackle on the demi-Columbian had been loosed, and the machine, slightly askew, permitted gently to sink to full rest on the floor, and the result justified the experts. 2. By the time people had started to eat, but informally, as it were apologetically, Passover meals, evening was at hand. The clayhangers later had met at table. A strange repast, a strange father. The children had difficulty in speaking naturally. And then Mrs. Hamps had come, ebulliently thanking God and conveying the fact that the town was thrilled and standing utterly amazed in admiration before her heroical nephew. And yet she had said ardently that she was in no way amazed at her nephew's coolness. She would have been surprised if he had shown himself even one degree less cool. From a long study of his character she had foreknown infallibly that in such a crisis as had supervened he would behave precisely as he had behaved. This attitude of Auntie Hamps, however, though it reduced the miraculous to the ordinary expected, did not diminish Clara's ingenuous awe of Edwin. From a mocker, the child had been temporarily transformed into an unwilling hero-worshipper. Mrs. Hamps having departed, all the family, including Darius, had retired earlier than usual. And now, on meeting his father and Big James and Miss Ingemells in the queer peace of the morning, in the relaxation after tension, and in the complete realisation of the occurrence, it had been perceived from the demeanour of all that, by an instinctive action extending over perhaps five seconds of time, he procured for himself a wondrous and apparently permanent respect. Miss Ingemells, when he went vaguely into the freshly watered shop before breakfast, greeted him in a new tone, and with startling deference asked him what he thought he had been better do in regard to the addressing of a certain parcel. He had been considered this odd. He considered it illogical. And one consequence of Miss Ingemells's quite sincere attitude was that he despised Miss Ingemells for a moral weakling. He knew that he himself was a moral weakling, but he was sure that he could never bend, never crouch, to such a posture as Miss Ingemells's. That she was obviously sincere only increased his secret scorn. But his father resembled Miss Ingemells. Edwin had not dreamt that mankind, and especially his father, was characterised by such simplicity. And yet on reflection, had he not always found in his father a peculiar ingenuousness which he could not but look down upon? His father, whom he met crossing the yard, spoke to him almost as he might have spoken to a junior partner. It was more than odd. It was against nature, as Edwin had conceived nature. He was so superior and lofty, yet without intending it, that he made no attempt to put himself in his father's place. He, in the exciting moments between the first cracking sound and the second, had had a vision of wrecked machinery and timber in an abyss at his feet. His father had had a vision far more realistic and terrifying. His father had seen the whole course of his printing business brought to a standstill, and all his savings dragged out of him to pay for reconstruction and for new machinery. His father had seen loss of life, which might be accounted to his negligence. His father had seen, with that pessimism which may overtake anybody in a crisis, the ruin of a career, the final frustration of his lifelong daring and obstinacy, and the end of everything. And then he had seen his son suddenly walk forth 
and save the frightful situation. He had always looked down upon that son as helpless, coddled, incapable of initiative or of boldness. He believed himself to be a highly remarkable man, and existence had taught him that remarkable men seldom or never have remarkable sons. Again and again had he noted the tendency of remarkable men to beget gaping and idle fools. Nevertheless, he had intensely desired to be able to be proud of his son. He had intensely desired to be able, when acquaintances should be sincerely enthusiastic about the merits of his son, to pretend, insincerely and with pride only half concealed, that his son was quite an ordinary youth. Now his desire had been fulfilled. It had been more than fulfilled. The town would chatter about Edwin's presence of mind for a week. Edwin's act would become historic. It already was historic. And not only was the act in itself wonderful and admirable and epoch-making, but it proved that Edwin, despite his blondness, his finickiness, his hesitations, had grit. That was the point. The lad had grit. There was material in the lad of which much could be made. Add to this the father's mere instinctive gratitude, a gratitude of such unguessed depth that it had prevented him even from being ashamed of having publicly and impulsively embraced his son on the previous morning. Edwin, in his unconscious egoism, ignored all that. 3. "'I've just seen Barlow,' said Darius confidentially to Edwin. Barlow was the baker. "'He's been here afore his rounds. He's willing to sublet me his storeroom. So that'll be all right, eh?' "'Yes,' said Edwin, seeing that his approval was being sought for. "'We must fix that machine plumb again.' "'I suppose the floor's as firm as rocks now,' Edwin suggested. "'Hey, bless ye, yes,' said his father, with a trace of kindly impatience. The policy of makeshift was to continue. The floor having been stayed with oak, the easiest thing, and the least immediately expensive thing, was to leave matters as they were. When the baker's stores were cleared from his warehouse, Darius could use the spaces between the pillars for lumber of his own, and he could either knock an entrance way through the wall in the yard, or he could open the nailed-down trapdoor and patch the ancient stairway within. Or he could do nothing. It would only be walking out into Woodison Bank and up the alley each time he wanted access to his lumber. And yet, after the second cracking sound on the previous day, he had been ready to vow to rent an entirely new and common-sense printing office somewhere else, if only he should be saved from disaster that once. But he had not quite vowed, and in any case a vow to oneself is not a vow to the Virgin. He had escaped from a danger, and the recurrence of the particular danger was impossible. Why then commit follies of prudence when the existing arrangement of things would do? 4. That afternoon, Darius Clayhanger, with his most mysterious air of business, told Edwin to follow him into the shop. Several hours of miscellaneous consultative pottering had passed between Darius and his compositors round and about the new printing machine, which was once more plumb and ready for action. For considerably over a week Edwin had been on his father's general staff, without any definite task or occupation having been assigned to him. His father had been too excitedly preoccupied with the arrival and erection of the machine, to bestow due thought upon the activities proper to Edwin in the complex dailiness of the business. Now he meant at any rate to begin to put the boy into a suitable niche. The boy had deserved at least that. At the desk he opened before him the daily and weekly newspaper book, and explained its system. "'Let's take the British Mechanic,' he said, and he turned to the page where the title British Mechanic was written in red ink. Underneath that title were written the names and addresses of fifteen subscribers to the paper. To the right of the names were thirteen columns, representing a quarter of the year. With his customary laboriousness, Darius described the entire process of distribution. The parcel of papers arrived and was counted, and the name of a subscriber scribbled in an abbreviated form on each copy. Some copies had to be delivered by the errand boy. These were handed to the errand boy, and a tick made against each subscriber in the column for the week. Other copies were called for by the subscriber, 
and as each of these was taken away, similarly a tick had to be made against the name of its subscriber. Some copies were paid for in cash in the shop. Some were paid in cash to the office boy, some were paid for monthly, some were paid for quarterly, and some, as Darius said grimly, were never paid for at all. No matter what the method of paying, when a copy was paid for, or thirteen copies were paid for, a crossing tick had to be made in the book for each copy. Thus, for a single quarter of British mechanic, nearly two hundred ticks and nearly two hundred crossing ticks had to be made in the book, if the work was properly done. However, it was never properly done. Miss Ingemar has been short of leisure and the errand boy utterly unreliable, and Darius wanted it properly done. The total gross profit on a quarter of British mechanics was less than five shillings, and no customers were more exigent and cantankerous than those who bought one pennyworth of goods per week and had them delivered free and received three months' credit. Still, that could not be helped. A printer and stationer was compelled by usage to supply papers. And besides, paper subscribers served a purpose as a nucleus of general business. As with the British mechanics, so with seventeen other weeklies. The daily papers were fewer, but the accountancy they caused was even more elaborate. For monthly magazines there was a separate book with a separate system. Here the sums involved were vaster, ranging as high as half a crown. Darius led Edwin with patient minuteness through the whole labyrinth. Now, he said, you're going to have sole charge of all this. And he said it benevolently, in the conviction that he was awarding a deserved recompense, with the mien of one who was giving dominion to a faithful steward over ten cities. Just look into it carefully yourself, lad, he said at last, and left Edwin with a mixed parcel of journals upon which to practice. Before Edwin's eyes flickered hundreds of names, thousands of figures, and tens of thousands of ticks. His heart protested. It protested with loathing. The prospect stretching far in front of him made him feel sick. But something weak and good-natured in him forced him to smile, and to simulate a subdued ecstasy at receiving this overwhelming proof of his father's confidence in him. As for Darius, Darius was delighted with himself and with his son, and he felt that he was behaving as a benignant father should. Edwin had proved his grit, proved that he had that uncommunicable quality, character, and had well-deserved encouragement. 5. The next morning, in the printing office, Edwin came upon Big James giving a lesson in composing to the younger apprentice, who in theory had learned his cases. Big James held the composing stick in his great left hand like a matchbox, and with his great right thumb and index picked letter after letter from the case, very slowly in order to display the movement, and dropped them into the stick. In his mild, resonant tones he explained that each letter must be picked up unfalteringly in a particular way, so that it would drop face upward into the stick without any intermediate manipulation. And he explained also that the left hand must be held so that the right hand would have to travel to and fro as little as possible. He was revealing the basic mysteries of his craft, and was happy, making the while the broad series of stock pleasantries which had probably been current in composing rooms since printing was invented. Then he was silent, working more and more quickly, till his right hand could scarcely be followed in his twinklings, and the face of the apprentice duly spread in marvel. When the line was finished, he drew out the rule, clapped it down on the top of the last row of letters, and gave the composing stick to the apprentice to essay. The apprentice began to compose with his feet, his shoulders, his mouth, his eyebrows, with all his body except his hands, which nevertheless travelled spaciously far and wide. "'It's not in seven year nor in seventy as you'll learn, young son of a gun,' said Big James. And having unsettled the youth to his foundations with a bland thwack across the head, he resumed the composing stick, and began again the exposition of the unique smooth movement, which is the root of rapid typesetting. "'Here,' said Big James, when the apprentice had behaved worse than ever, "'was the last Mr. Edwin to have a go. This'll show us what he'll do.' 
and Edwin, sheepish, had to comply. He was in pride, bound to surpass the apprentice, and did so. "'There,' said Big James, "'what did I tell ye?' He seemed to imply a prophecy, that because Edwin had saved the printing office from destruction two days previously, he would necessarily prove to be a born compositor. The apprentice deferentially sniggered, and Edwin smiled modestly and awkwardly, and departed without having accomplished what he had come to do. By his own act of cool, nonchalant, unconsidered courage in a crisis, he had, it seemed, definitely proved himself to possess a special aptitude in all branches of the business of printer and stationer. Everybody assumed it. Everybody was pleased. Everybody saw that Providence had been kind to Darius and to his son. The fathers of the town and the mothers, who liked Edwin's complexion and fair hair, told each other that not every parent was so fortunate as Mr. Clayhanger, and what a blessing it was that the old breed was not after all dying out in these new-fangled days. Edwin could not escape from the universal assumption. He felt it round him as a net which somehow he had to cut. End of Volume 1, Chapter 13